Welcome to The Dish, the show that uncovers the stories behind the world's most famous dishes. We are your hosts, Tomo and Megzi from foodfuntravel.com. Join us and expert guests for tasty facts, foody secrets and more. In this episode, what to eat in Lisbon. Fishy history, the surprising story of how cod became one of Portugal's national dishes. Porky power, the Portuguese sandwich that locals can't seem to get enough of. Plus, the Lisbon liqueur that left our shoes sticking to the sidewalk. Welcome to another episode of The Dish. Hola. Because, of course, we're talking about Lisbon today. Si. Si. We don't really speak Portuguese, but that's nope. almost the same as Spanish, so... <laughs> we can, that's about as far as we get. Makes it a little bit easier for us. Yes, we're talking about what to eat in Lisbon, the capital of Portugal, a vibrant city built onto the hills surrounding the river Tagus, or in Portuguese, apparently it's pronounced oh, Rio Tejo. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. But uh, I might be pronouncing that wrong. That's just what I've, I've found out. But if you've never been to Lisbon, it is, oh, I don't know, it's just lovely. Yeah. It's just really lovely. I don't think I know a single person that's been there and just hasn't fallen in love with it because it's just really quaint. It's easy going. It's pretty. It's built on hills. So there's like all The these... hills aren't always easy going. No, but to look at, yeah. you might want to walk up and down them. That's what the trams are for. And the buses. Funicular. Funiculars. All these different funicular, modes of transport. Funicular, funicular, funicular. <laughs> no idea what that reference is. But anyway. It's good to know. Um, <laughs> good to know, <laughs> even though I don't know what it is. Uh, yeah, so Lisbon's just inland from the Atlantic Ocean, which is going to become important as we discuss things about food in this episode. Um, as a cosmopolitan capital... In Lisbon, you are going to find cuisine from all over Portugal and all over the world. There's plenty of international food, especially dishes from ex-Portuguese colonies like Angola, Goa, Brazil, and many more. And uh, more recently, immigrant cuisine that has arrived from places like Nepal. Nepal is just going crazy in the last 20 years. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, people like momos. Yep, it's uh, Momo Madness on the streets. <laughs> Indeed <laughs> it is. Completely over-the-top amount of uh, Nepalese restaurants selling Momos. We just saw them everywhere. But in this episode, we're going to focus on the traditional foods of Portugal, things that are very specific, that came from Lisbon and mainland Portugal, and now, of course, our everyday favourites in Lisbon. So when you take your trip there, you're going to get to eat these things. Uh, before we get started, of course, subscribe to the show. On Apple Podcasts yeah, or if it's wherever your you listen. First time joining us, just hit that little subscribe button so that you get all of our future episodes. And then you can also scroll back and listen to some of our old ones as well, because there's some crackers in there, let's admit. None about crackers. We haven't done an episode on crackers. No, but um, as in very good episodes. <laughs> Excellent. No crackers at all. Thank you for that almost British explanation of our <laughs> past content. All right, I'm going to smash through some quick history for Portugal and Lisbon, as we like to do, just to give you a bit of an introduction, because it does help you understand how the food relates to the history, because it always relates to the history. Of course. So Portugal is about 35,000 square miles. It's a strip of land along the Atlantic Ocean. You probably know that already if you're thinking of going there. If you're not, do think of going there, because it's a very cool place to go. It's at the very southern, like southern western corner of continental Europe. It's right down on the end. Yeah. And you can actually like go to this point at the very end of Portugal where people thought for a really long time that it was the end of the earth and you can watch the sunset go down there and it's like it's like it sizzles into the ocean. And you could just imagine being like, you know, not knowing very much about the world, however many, you know, thousand years ago and being like, well, bye, son. Hope you come back tomorrow. You've gone as far as you can go. You this can't is go the any end further. Of the earth. There's just no land past that that you can see. Flat earthers would be all over that. Sailors hadn't found anything else. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through as well. Yeah, so it's pretty crazy. It's a really cool spot. It's not in Lisbon. It's a few hours from Lisbon, like four, four and a half hours from Lisbon. But yeah, it's the Atlantic. Massive old Atlantic. People are like, that's the end of the world. Nothing's going to be across that. Boy, were they wrong. But still, Portugal itself has about 500 miles of coastline. It's like 800 kilometers, something like that. And so that means seafood is a 
big, big thing in Portugal because that's like one tiny little country that's just a big strip of coastline, basically. Yeah, yeah they're all just fishing like crazy. They love it. Yes. And their proximity to the ocean also played a part in their colonial past, of course, and they traded and conquered their way around the globe. The back and forth of ingredients from both East and West has greatly shaped Portuguese cuisine, as well as Portuguese leaving their culinary mark all over the world, from Brazil to Mozambique, Macau to Goa in India, and many, many more places that the Portuguese left their influence. Going a bit further back in time, Portugal was once occupied by the Romans, who are attributed with introducing wheat, onions, garlic, olives, and grapes. So Portuguese wine hey, today hey. is fantastic, and supposedly they weren't even really making wine until the Romans got them some grapes going on. So are they, they're actually like Roman varieties of grapes, like from like up like Italy way, or where did they get the grapes from? I have no idea, because yeah. we're not talking about Portuguese wine in this episode. No. <laughs> it's something that we might actually do a full episode on, because Portuguese wine is really cool, and it's not a world-famous wine-producing country, and yet the wine they make there is great. And, of course, the port. And the ports. That's something that we might talk about in another episode as well, because there was a, a big thing with port. But that's not from Lisbon, so that's why we're not talking about it today. So after the Romans, the Moors turned up, as they did throughout all of sort of Spain, that southern, southern part of Spain. They got there around 711 AD, and they came from North Africa. They brought things like rice, figs, lemons and oranges, and almond trees. And the south of Portugal is full oh, of citrus and almond trees. The almond trees are so pretty when they bloom. I had no idea that... They were that gorgeous until I saw them blooming. And I was like, what is that tree? And they're like, almond trees. And I'm like, no. It's like a pretty white flower. It's like a cherry blossom almost. Yeah, except yeah, more white. Yeah. But they're really pretty. Modern day Portugal found its roots in the north of the country, where a Visigoth state actually eventually became called Portugal and slowly took back those Moorish lands to the south of the peninsula, all the way down to the Algarve coast, which is the very south part of Portugal, which has got lots of beaches and cliffs. We lived there for five months uh, like recently, and it's, it's a really nice, pretty place to stay. Gorgeous. Great weather in the winter. That's the main reason we stayed there as well, as well as the food and people are great as well. By the 15th century, the Great Age of Discovery had begun. Before the Americas were discovered in 1492, Portuguese explorers had already claimed many Atlantic islands like Cape Verde, the Azores, uh, Madeira, and they'd also taken land south along the coast of Africa. So they were already getting out there and doing things before Columbus even disappeared and found America. Yeah. So, yeah, they were busy. They were all busy. Yeah. In fact, in the 15th century, Prince Henry, the navigator of Portugal, instructed his Portuguese explorers to bring back any exotic fruits, nuts, and plants that they found. All these new ingredients that they could then try and grow at home and in enjoy these new things. So they were way out there trying to find new food as well. They were, they were onto it. Mm, good thing they didn't find durian. <laughs> A funny thing how people went all around the world exploring and trading fruits and foods and spices, and that old durian didn't get traded so well, did it? I, it's an acquired taste, and um, it's really big, so I guess they went, this stinks and it's big, we're not putting it on a boat. We're going to leave that in Asia, Southeast Asia, they you can, can keep, keep it. keep that. So as Portugal gained new lands, things like tomatoes and potatoes were brought back home, African coffee was sent to create massive plantations in Brazil. So they got their coffee from Africa and then they went and planted it in Brazil to make more coffee. And vice versa, chilies came back from Brazil and were planted in Portugal's African colonies. And the little chilies called Piri Piri are something very famous in Portugal. They love their little Piri Piri chilies. They use it in a lot of different foods. But we're not going to be talking that much about that today because we're going to have another episode specifically talking about Piri Piri. Think Nando's, but 75 times better. <laughs> I've done my research. It's exactly 75 times better. They do piri-piri chicken so well in Portugal. Um, also, spices coming from the east, it's coming from India, etc. Um, they love their curry powder. They just use that as a, as a flavoring for certain things. Cinnamon, very popular. They use that on quite a lot of dishes as well. And that all came from the Indian side. Now, as a fishing nation, because they're so coastally minded, I guess he'd say. Uh, exploration wasn't just about the conquest. They actually also were sending fishermen out on longer voyages to find new fishing grounds. 
which is where we're going to get started with food today. We're going to talk about one of Portugal's national dishes. It's called bacalao. Oh, yes. You'll see this on pretty much every menu. In every supermarket. Yeah, it's everywhere. Bacalao is salt cod. So that's basically cod preserved with salt. And locals will tell you, of course, this is not just one dish. In fact, they might tell you it's at least 365 dishes, one for every day of the year. That's how much they love their bacalao. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not as much of a fan as the Portuguese are, but they, they do love it. There's a lot of fish dishes. There's a lot of cod dishes specifically. And specifically, when it comes to cuisine, this word bacalao, that means salted cod. Even though technically in the dictionary, bacalao means cod. If, when you're talking about food, if you want fresh cod, not salt cod, then you have to call it bacalao fresco, fresh cod. Otherwise, if it says bacalao on the menu, assume that it's salt cod. Straight up salted. Which, it's been salted and dried, but they rehydrate it when they make the food. Yeah. But it just means that it's a slightly different texture than Well, it's going to be cod. back in those days of when they were at sea and, and out there and they had these salted things that they could sort of like, that would just last. You know, they didn't have to worry about it going off and then they can like bring it back and turn it into a dish. Easy peasy. That's pretty much exactly part of the story for sure. Uh, in reality, yeah, because the weird thing is, and it's the first thing if you actually do a little thought into this, is that cod does not swim in Portuguese waters at all. I was going to ask you this, actually. There's no cod swimming around Portugal. Yeah. So this is the weird, weird thing. It's become a national dish, but there's no cod there. And so, yeah, the reason it became a national dish is because they went out on these voyages of discovery and they found new fishing grounds and they found this fish that was abundant. No, they weren't really competing with people to catch it. So there was lots of it and they kept bringing it back and it meant it was like super cheap. So it is true to, that like today they get the majority of their cod from Norway. Is that right? Today they do. But uh, before that, when it actually became popular, they weren't getting it from Norway. So what happened was in the 16th century, after the discovery of the Americas, Portuguese fishermen headed on some really long voyages all the way out to Newfoundland. That's pretty far. That's a really long way to go fishing, right? Yep. yep. Like I've done that trip. I've legit done that trip. Well, I did it from Dover across the top, like the, across the Arctic way and over to Newfoundland. Dover in England? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, in England. Uh, the old White Cliffs of Dover. White Cliffs of Dover. Uh, yeah, and straight across the top over to Newfoundland that way. So I've done that trip. It's far. From Portugal, like, even it's further. even more crazy. So yeah. you're like diagonally across. Um, yeah, that's really far. So they're like, hey, do you want to get some fish? All right, see you in like five months. Yeah. It's going to go out there and fish for ages and then come back. Um, so that was pretty crazy. That area where Newfoundland is at the time in the 16th century was actually British territory. Because obviously like Canada and stuff was all British. America was British at that, part, at that point, North America, mostly on that side, Eastern Seaboard. People were fighting about stuff. Stuff was changing hands. Uh, but yeah. it was pretty British at the time. So what they did was... Because the Portuguese were allies with Britain, they've been allies with Britain since like before the 16th century. It's like it is the longest alliance that has existed on the planet between two countries is between Portugal and England. The bromance. The bromance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the political bromance. <laughs> because they were mates with the British, what they did was they went, all right, well, we want to fish here, but this is your bit of water. And how about we just do a trade? So Portugal has loads and loads of salt. They... Farm salt. I don't know with salt, isn't it? It can grow in the ocean. I say grow. I mean, it doesn't grow. It, it appears in the ocean through evaporation or it appears on land because it's in rocks and stuff. I, I don't know. We need to do an episode on salt. I it doesn't sound salt. exciting, to be honest. Although it's one of my favorite things. I put it on everything and I use it with everything. I'm always like, there isn't enough salt in this. And this then I'm like, got, my cholesterol is going to go through the roof. There's got to be so much history to salt. I don't know. Because it has been like people have bought and died over salt for thousands of well, years. Well, like, Tuscany doesn't use any salt in their bread because there was, like, big salt arguments. Was it Tuscany? And they were like, stop yeah, you. Tuscany. They're like, I don't need your salt. You can't tax me on salt. Forget it. Keep your salt. And now, they, to this day, they don't put salt in their bread. It's very silly. Okay. Anyway, other episode, maybe a good idea. Yeah. That, that would be something we could talk about at some point. So, Portuguese went, we've got loads of salt. We need to bring it with us anyway. Or, I mean, maybe they sent it from Portugal to Britain and it was all just done and agreed. 
Uh, so then all the Portuguese ships went out there, and in return, they got the right to fish in those grounds around Newfoundland, and they even got some military protection from the British naval ships that were sailing around anyway. Hey. So it was a pretty big win, considering they were just giving people salt. In those days, it was it's a bit more valuable, yeah. and today it's like, oh, you're giving them salt? That's, that's like 10 cents a kilo or something. I no refrigeration, they needed their salt. Exactly. Everyone needed salt a lot more in those days for food. And of course, we say yeah, no refrigeration, and that meant the only way to get the fish back was to also salt them. They were not going to keep on a long voyage back from Newfoundland. Oh, could you imagine being on that ship? Ew. Stinky ship. It's a very stinky ship. Pass. You think walking past the salt cod section in the supermarket in Portugal is stinky? Yeah. Like, imagine you've got a mix of fresh fish, rotting fish guts that they've, like, pulled out of the fish. Because oh, I... they have to process all the fish on the ship. Yeah. To ma- they make the salt cod on the boat. So they've got to do all of that. And this actually, yeah, is, is quite a horrible, horrible lifestyle to be a, a fisherman for this I hope those people are paid thing. decent. I really don't think they are. No. It, th- th- they get wh- paid at what in point, cod. At what point have horrible jobs like that ever been paid really well? <laughs> True. There is no historic situation where that happens. No. But yeah, certain types of fish actually lend themselves much better to the salt preservation process. So you can't do it with any type of fish. Uh, some fish, it doesn't work as well, but cod, it works really well. Because they are less oily in the flesh. Most of their oil is in their organs and you get rid of all that. Yeah. So, yeah, they're like a less oily flesh fish. So they preserved really, really well as a dried salted fish. And this long shelf life meant that they could get all that food back to Portugal. People who bought it could have it for ages. It would keep in supermarkets. Well, they didn't have supermarkets. They had markets. Markets. And that meant... It actually became a staple, not only for the rich, but the poor as well. Everyone could get their cod. That was a thing. And by the 18th century, everyone was definitely getting their cod and eating it too. (laughs) So it it was uh, more popular than cake, perhaps. I don't know. Never. No, probably not. It became this really common part of Easter and Christmas dishes because during those religious holidays, they weren't supposed to eat meat, like a Catholicism thing. So they started eating fish instead. And the like fresh fish was much more expensive than this salted cod because fresh fish went off so quickly and ended up costing a lot more money. So that's another reason why it became popular because people started associating salt cod with a religious festival. So it was uh. like, a, oh, I always have this every Christmas. I always have this every Easter. It's what my grandma used to cook. And so you actually remember that and you continue the tradition and it continues to be popular. Over time, the political situations changed, as of course did the availability of refrigeration. Portuguese fishing in Newfoundland declined, and they eventually stopped fishing there altogether. And much of the cod was being supplied to Portugal instead by British fleets who were fishing in other northern waters rather than Newfoundland, which meant they were having to now pay to get the cod in. Uh, I guess, I guess, by the early 20th century, when this was sort of mainly happening, the British weren't just like, "Yeah, give us some salt, and we'll we'll sort you out." They were <laughs> no. like, "No, no, you might want to give us some." money or something yeah. for this sort of stuff. So yeah, at this point, by the early 20th century, most of the cod is coming from waters around Iceland and Norway, which is where it still comes more from around Norway today. So with meat and fresh fish being really expensive at the time, poorer people really still had to rely on this salt cod because it was probably it's pretty much the cheapest uh, like animal protein they could get. But because the importing raised the price, uh, this caused problems. And people were no longer being able to afford to eat protein. That doesn't work very well for societies, does it? That yep. never works out well. Um, so after the military dictatorship first began in 1926, the one sort of semi-positive thing the government did was they went on a mission to rebuild the fishing fleets and increase production that was done by Portuguese people so they weren't importing all the time. They fixed the cod prices so that people could actually afford to buy it. So it was sort of subsidized in some way. But what this actually led to more was that the workforce who were employed and sort of forced to be employed, yeah. made to go and work on the ships, they were living in horrible, horrible conditions and getting like no money for what they were doing. So like I read up about the process. There's actually an article I found online that had like these old photos from the 1930s and stuff of fishermen doing this job. And yeah, it, it looks pretty terrible. Individual fishermen would basically launch off the main ship with their own little sort of tiny boat. Yeah. So like a little like dinghy. They would go off 
all of them would go off separately. They'd go off for like at least eight hours, no protection from the sun or the elements at all. It's just a little tiny dinghy. And then they would basically be catching the cod with a spear, maybe a small net and a spear. And they would then bring all of this stuff back. And after eight hours out in the sun collecting these fish, they then had to start processing them to get them salted before they start going off. Yeah. So they did all of that. And then you get a few hours sleep and then you repeat. And they were obviously working hundreds and hundreds of miles away from home. So it's pretty awful. Oh, that's horrible work. Yeah. So that was pretty terrible. No one really wanted that. Uh, I mean, if it wasn't for the dictatorship sort of propping up what was going on, then the industry would have already collapsed. So when the dictatorship in Portugal did collapse itself in 1974, that was pretty much it for the Portuguese cod industry. So fishermen were freed from their coerced labor, which is great, but it meant that all of their supply of cod had to return to importation and paying higher prices. So to the point now today where I've, I've read some articles, interviews with locals saying like back in the day, grandma used to buy an entire bacalao. She bought like a whole cod and it's huge and it would last the family for ages. And these days people like buy a piece of cod and it's like for more special occasions. You don't just eat it at home all the time, like yeah. things like that. So even now today in the 2000s, it's like, oh, it's actually a bit pricey. Well, we were even quite surprised when we ordered cod at the like a local restaurant at how expensive it was. But that was at the time when we didn't realize all of this history and we thought, well, like, I can see the ocean right there. Why is this cod so expensive? <laughs> there's no cod in there's their waters. No, no, there's no cod. There's no cod there. I don't know why I'm doing a strange pirate accent for a Portuguese because sailor. Because why not? Why not? It is seafaring related. Exactly. So I think pirate accents are the way to go. I think any excuse to use a pirate accent should be just rolled with. Just exactly. Arr. Cod. <laughs> Where's my cod? Yeah, exactly. That's about right. So there you go. That's the story of cod. And today it's imported cod that gets salted. I guess production uh, is going to be affected by the fact that waters are running out of fish. So that's not helping either. But I didn't look into uh, something that detailed about today because it's all very depressing. It is really depressing. But stop fishing, everyone. But yeah, moving on. We like fish, but... Not that much. More farmed fish, I guess, so we can sustain things. Um, So if you're in Lisbon... How are you going to eat this cod? Because uh, I said before, there's like at least 365 different ways they make cod. What is the Lisbon variety that you have to have when you're there? Well, the most popular style in Lisbon is bacalao abarash, which is after the cod has been rehydrated, it is shredded and mixed with egg. It's also finely chopped onion and some crispy little matchstick potatoes. Oh, then, they're good. Yeah, we know they're good. They do potato really well. In Portugal, I don't know what it is, but they know how to cook a potato, whether it be boiling it, like chopping it up into fries, make it in matchstick fries. I don't know what they do, but every time they do something with potato, it's delish. Yeah, potatoes are a big part of the, uh, of the culinary tradition. There's they so many dishes. You get potatoes on the side of everything. They love chips. They love boiled potatoes. They like confit potatoes in olive oil. So much of that. It's great. Actually, cod with, like, you can get it baked in olive oil with potatoes and onions and so it's all just just this amazing olive oil garlic sort of taste yeah that's such a great dish as well i can't pronounce the name of that it's in the article if you check out foodfuntravel.com slash lisbon podcast uh it's like bacalao alagario but I, I think it's pronounced differently but yeah it means baked cod but anyway back to a bacalao abarash it's basically mixed up into this cod cake but there's uh, the potato instead of making it into a potato cake it's just got these little matchstick potatoes, so they don't actually mash up into it. They're actually, they're whole, they're formed. So you're biting into it and you get these little crispy potato chunks every time you get a bite. So you've got the fishy bit, tasty cod with these, these little matchstick potatoes mm. all the way through it. Good texture. Yeah, really interesting texture, having that soft cod ball thing with all of these bits of crispy potato. So yeah, that's baked in the oven until it's ready to go and then they serve it with a bit of parsley and black olives on top. Now the name Abarash is said to refer to the name of the person who created the dish I couldn't find out that much about him but apparently he worked in the Barrio Alto district of Lisbon which is sort of like the nightlife hub just up the hill it's one of the, so I'm, it's not hipster but it's sort of on the way to being hipster it's, you know, it's, it's just the funkiest area of town. Yeah, it's, a, it's a hip funky area to go 
Another way to eat this actually is with the potato mashed up into it. Bolinos de bacalao, also called pastis de bacalao. They are little cod and potato fritters, a bit like croquettes. They are very tasty. You can find them as street food or you can Super find them in restaurants. Super popular. That's a really, really popular dish to try in Lisbon. Because it's just a really cheap little snack. Yeah, it's easy. And it's tasty and easy, yeah. It's, it's just nice. A homely, tasty snack. Also, on a hot day, you could look out for bacalao com grau, which is cod with chickpeas in salad form. Sounds like a cold cod dish. And for a really naughty treat, something we didn't get to try out, but I really want to try next time we go, is bacalao con natas, which is cod and fried potatoes baked in a cream sauce until golden. Ooh, so basically it's that sounds naughty. thick cream sauce all around it. And then on top, the bits of potato and cod that are sticking out go crispy in the oven. Very naughty. Oh, yeah, that's good. So that's cod. Let's talk about Portugal's other favorite protein, Mr. Pig. Oh, yes. Monsieur Porco. In particular, it seems to be a lot of black pig in Portugal. There's black pig, but they also have other pigs. There's yeah. lots of different pigs. But, but they love the black pig. Yeah. They got a lot of black pigs that live sort of in the south, bit south of Lisbon. The area between Lisbon and the Algarve coast is sort of where they rear a lot of pigs. That's a good, good bit of land for that, apparently. But yeah. The main historical reason for liking pork more than other meats is just because their landscape and climate happens to be ideal for rearing pigs. Yeah. Whereas for, for cows, they would need big, wide, open fields, whereas it's more sort of, yeah, it's better for pigs. They, they don't have that as much. They love beef. They have beef. But pork is like the number one. Cod and pork. It's what it's all about. Now, probably the favorite way to eat a bit of pork in Lisbon is a bafana. Yes. Remember the Bafana? Yes. And it, it's interesting that it's actually a thing that I had not heard of until, I mean, I think even the first time we went to Portugal, like three or four years ago, we hadn't even heard of the Bafana. No. But this is like the must try little pork sandwich. Yeah. You got the pork sandwich, which is the Bafana. That's absolutely the most popular one. And then you've got its cousin, Prego, which is the beef equivalent, beef sandwich. Mm -hmm. And also the Lechao, which is basically lechon, it's pulled pork, suckling pig pulled pork. Dirty. In a sandwich. So it's a great cheap lunch, a late night snack, street food, or you can even sit down in a restaurant and order these sometimes. Um, and really, it starts from like a couple of euros as a street snack. That up is to the a few absolute that. street food of Lisbon is Bafana and you, there's little stores everywhere that are selling it and they all do it in their own different way and they all have their own little different marinade and then you can choose whether or not you want to like smother it in yellow mustard or I think sometimes there's like a chili sauce that you piri can have Piri-piri sauce, oh, of piri course. Piri-piri, yeah. So, yeah, I don't think I've ever had two Bafanas the same. No, everyone does it a little bit differently. Yeah. So everyone's got their own little trick and yeah. We call it street food, but of course Portugal is is pretty modern. So by street food, we basically oh, I mean, mean like hole in the wall. Takeaway food, like yeah. It, yeah, it's hole in the wall places. Yeah, that you know that's what you they stand do. up and eat. They make like five or six things, and pork sandwich bifana is probably one of them. Um, yeah, so it's that sort of thing. Lots of these little hole in the wall spots as you walk around Lisbon, which is great. The recipes and styles of bifana do differ a little, as we said. Every place does theirs a little bit differently, of course. But the general principle is that you get really thinly cut slices of pork steak. Uh, they're simmered in a sort of white wine stock with garlic, olive oil, some paprika, bay leaf, vinegar, and sometimes piri-piri as well for a little bit of extra spice. And you'll quite often see these pots of pork simmering in the window. It basically just lets people know, like, you can get this pork sandwich Bafana right here. here. Come get the pork. <laughs> oh, yeah. And so that's what people are up for. Why not? Why wouldn't you want a pork sandwich? Uh, normally, the meat is just like pulled straight out of that big bubbling pot of sauce, and some of the juices soak down onto the bread roll. The bread rolls are specifically designed with a soft inside and then like a firmer crust so that the middle can go a bit soft and the outside doesn't fall apart and get soggy or anything like that. Uh, so you basically just got this salty, porky meat bomb waiting to explode in your mouth. Yeah. It's so good. Sometimes if you get that extra sort of crispy end pork bits where it's like, just browned off a bit and it's a bit like crunchy. That's also really good as well. Yeah. Well, what they do actually is that sometimes it's a whole pork cutlet that is used rather than those little thin slices. But they also have this thing called bifana gradara, which uh, means a grilled pork sandwich. And although it might be called bifana on the menu, normally it will say bifana gradara. 
and that specifically means like it hasn't been stewed. It might have been marinated, but then it's put on the grill. Yeah. So those ones, especially, that's where you get like the crispy end bits because it's been grilled. I think um, that was my personal favorite. But yeah. I mean, each to their own. And as we said before, like there's no two bufanas the same. So you can just eat your way around Lisbon, just eating these super cheap bufanas. And I, I mean, it'll be different every single time. You could make an article, 20 top bufanas in Portugal. I would like to read that. But how do you differentiate? Like, it's like you would have to get down to the nuances of the difference in the, in the marinade. and How soft the bread is. Yeah. Yeah. How, how sweet the mustard is. Yeah, which mustard they're using, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, this is something to look out for is that the classic bufana is cooked in that sort of stew and then pulled out and put on the bread. But you, if you order a bufana grillada by accident, then you just get a slice of pork. And yeah, I agree with Megzi that the pork was very well done where we had it, but I feel like it didn't have the flavors of Bafana and the bread was too dry because there was no juices. Yeah, you were wanting it to be really juicy. Yeah, I want a load of that liquid. I want it to be more like a dipped sandwich. I want all of that liquid coming out of the pot all over the bread, but instead it was basically just a piece of steak that was very tasty. They grilled it perfectly. It was obviously nicely marinated and it had very good flavor. But then the actual bread itself was just like a, a vessel to hold the pork. Yeah. I didn't need the bread. I could have just had the pork because the bread didn't do anything for the dish. Whereas when you have it with all of these juices with the paprika and white wine and stuff all soaking into the bun and all, yeah, the, that's true. all the fats from the pork have all collected in the juice, then it sort of makes the bread better and that sort of makes the sandwich better in my opinion. But, you know, everyone's got a different opinion on these things. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? But Bufana is actually so popular in Portugal that McDonald's released a McBufana. Really? Yeah. Uh, it's still on the menu. We never go to McDonald's. We wouldn't know. But no, I had no idea. It is a constant item on the menu, apparently, the muk bufana. That seems ridiculous to go to McDonald's to get a bufana when they're literally everywhere. I, I've got no idea why people choose that one, but I've got no idea why people choose McDonald's in general. So yeah, exactly. I can't really tell you. But yeah, just saying that if even McDonald's are getting in on this, then it's a thing. It's a thing. It's very popular. The other essential ingredient to this, especially if you've got a slightly drier piece of pork without all the juices being thrown on from the pot, is lots of squirty mustard, as Meg mentioned, or mm-hmm. piri-piri sauce. Yep. That's always something you can add. It's also worth noting, actually, I found out maybe in Porto is maybe would be my ideal Bafana, because in Porto, they make a big deal about putting a lot of sauce on. Ah. They want that to be a messy sandwich with lots of sauce. Whereas in Lisbon, I actually saw one of the guys, he pulled the pork out and like shook it off to get excess liquid off it. I'm like, what What are you doing? My sandwich is going to be dry. Why would you do this to me? <laughs> okay, so we're going to have to compare the Bufana in Porto, yep. which sadly we didn't make it to, to the ones in Lisbon. Either way, we had quite a few of these in Lisbon, and they were all good. They're all good. They're all good. I'm just, not saying that You can't go wrong with it. You can't go wrong. So as far as history goes, though, there's not a lot of history, but the Bufana may have been invented, probably, most people seem to think it was in Vendas Novas, which is a small town about 30 kilometers east of Lisbon. We didn't go there because uh, we went to Why? Lisbon and this is yeah. an episode about <laughs> Lisbon. And the main reason to go there is to eat Bafana and there's no other reason to go there. And we had plenty of Bafana in Lisbon. So, yeah. And apparently, pretty much if you go there, every single cafe and restaurant that sells Bafana says they invented it. Oh, it's one of those That's places. The, yeah, like, no, we invented it. Home of the Bafana. Inventors sure, of the Bafana. Oh, yeah, did. No one's really sure. I mean, it's pork in bread. Yeah, if someone slapped some pork on a bit of bread, like, no one's really going to be able to lay claim to that. So, I don't know. But if you check out our article, foodfuntravel.com slash Lisbon podcast, as well as all the food we're talking about here and a lot more dishes, we also recommend uh, a really cool little corner snack bar where you can get a, a very nice bafana. There is quite a few good places to go, but this one was um, a little bit more local. Is that the one that two food trippers took us to? Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, the guys that introduced us to this were two food trippers. Mindy and Daryl. Mindy and Daryl. Run another, they're food blogger friends of ours that actually are based in Lisbon right now. So they've uh, they've got the down low on on where to get the, like the not so touristy stuff because you can definitely go and like there's these, you know, we'll talk about the the pastiche de nadas later on and there's these really touristy places you can go and try all some of this Lisbon food. But, it is when you get in there, some of these people that are living there and trying the different places and trying the more, you know, not so touristy places that you find these little mum and pop shops that are just dealing out the good stuff. Yeah, that's what you want. 
So yeah, those guys are there. Check them out, twofoodtrippers.com with the number two rather than the word two. They, uh, they can give you some extra Lisbon food advice. They know mm-hmm. what's going on. Let's talk about another dish that's very simple, but it, it's a part of the fabric of Lisbon and has been for, well, actually probably at least a thousand years. So this is sardinas asado or sardinas grillado. Just means barbecued or grilled sardines. And it's what they do. It's really what they it's do. What- they do. You can't avoid fresh sardines in Portugal. I did. You did because you don't <laughs> apparently like fish. This entire episode, you're sitting around going like, oh, that dish. Fish again. Why are we talking about fish? <laughs> I did try some of it. I just, I tried some of yours. I just would never order it for myself. I mean, I guess most people listening to this episode have probably had fresh sardines, but I know I didn't have fresh sardines very often when I was younger. Well, it's certainly not something you have in Australia. No, in Australia, you don't. I mean, in the UK, you do. But, I mean, I'd have them, like, once a year if I was lucky, but not often. Yeah. So, but in Portugal, it's something where you literally could have them every week pretty easily because they're a very affordable meal. You go out and get um, sardines with all the chips and salad and everything on the side for, like, nine euros or something. It's, like, one of the cheapest dishes. And the sardines are all fished there because Lisbon is on this massive wide estuary that then flows out into the Atlantic about 20 kilometers down. So it's just full of sardines. But it is seasonal. People have to remember that as well. So there are certain times of the year that you go to Portugal and it does mean that the sardines you get are going to be frozen. It doesn't mean that they're not going to be grilled and just as good because we definitely were there in the wintertime, which wasn't sardine season, and they were still grilling up some tasty sardines. Well, so you told me. Yeah, the sardines are great. (laughs) So Tom says. Sardines from frozen is one of the fishes that works pretty well. I mean, most fish work. Quite well, well they snap frozen. freeze it, so it's, it's yeah. no drama. Yeah, it's good. But they've been catching sardines down there at least since the Moors were there in the 8th century AD. That was a thing they were eating as well, apparently. So, yeah, it is uh, much longer than the cod tradition. And, of course, the Moors wouldn't have been eating pork because they were no. Muslims. So, actually, this is probably one of the most traditional dishes of Lisbon that you can have because people have been eating this for so, so long. And, yeah. As you said, they, they are actually available year-round, but the biggest time of year to go and get them is when they come out fresh during the main harvest, which is in early June and through the rest of June. Uh, but right in early June, there's the Festival of St. Anthony, who is the patron saint of Lisbon and apparently the patron saint of sardine celebration. <laughs> um, and his specific patron saint day marks the celebration of the harvest, which is around June 13th. And at that point, you'll go from not just being able to get it on menus all over the city, but actually you'll find the street side grills that pop up and are just grilling sardines and you just walk around and get sardines, which seems pretty fun. Yeah. So yeah, if you're there in June, busy time of year, but would be really awesome to go in June and do that. And yeah, they're going to be better than from Frozen, but Frozen is fine. So don't worry about it. As well as grilled sardines, believe it or not, tinned sardines are like a local delicacy. People oh, love them in tins. Yeah, you can go into like the local markets and there will be tin sardine stores and they've got all their little fancy tins. They're actually really cool because they kind of like, some of them have made them really old school. So they look yep. like they would have been as they were made like back in the like in the 30s or 40s or even before that. So retro cans. Exactly, retro no, cans. Really cool. They look really cool. Um, as well as there being stores that do that, there's actually restaurants that are devoted to conservas, which means tinned conserved food. and Literally, you go in and you order the different tins of food that you want, and they'll do you like some salad garnish and drinks on the side. Uh, it's a thing. That's so Tinned weird. food restaurant. I mean, it's so different to like a cereal cafe, is it? Like- no, but this is a tradition in Portugal now. I don't know how long for, but uh, yeah, it's a thing that people are really up for. Now, another dish that our friends Daryl and Mindy threw at us because we didn't do enough research when we got there, and they're like, hang on, did you find out about this, was... Azicha cheese. And they had one of these and they were like, did you try this yet? And like, we didn't know about it. And then I tried it and then I researched it and went, oh my God, why didn't I read about this in advance? We should have totally been actually like searching this out instead of finding it by accident. But it's really awesome that they introduced it to us. Uh, It's an unpasteurized sheep cheese. And it's one of the few cheeses in the area that's awarded a protected designation of origin status. Uh, it can only be made in the town of Aziachau, 
or Azietau, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, it's about 40 kilometers east of Lisbon. It's a hard rind cheese. You don't eat the rind at all. Instead, you slice the top off, you get a spoon, and you just start digging this creamy sheep's cheese out of the middle. And it goes very nicely with a glass of red wine, of course. We're not going to talk about Portuguese wine in this episode, as I said a little bit earlier, but we might talk about it in, another, in a whole other episode because it's a, a big old topic. But interestingly, this cheese, as well as being something you really need to try, is also a vegetarian-friendly cheese because instead of using animal rennet, they actually use a local thistle flour that has the same effect and helps separate the curds and whey in the milk. There you go. So that's really unusual. I never even knew. I've never heard of that. I mean, I know obviously there are vegetarian cheeses and they must have ways of doing it, but this is not like some modern hipster vegetarian cheese. This is a traditional cheese that they've always done it this way. And apparently that works. Oh, so very cool. There you go. That's pretty cool. All right. So there's so many things to eat and we've already gone like 40 minutes in. So I think we need to do a quick lightning round to get through a few of the other main dishes. Good call. First up, a couple of sweet treats, desserts uh, that are essential to give a go when you are in Lisbon. Pastis de nada, possibly the most popular, most famous If you dessert. go to Portugal and do not eat this, then you've not been to Portugal. Exactly. Go back. Go back, get it, eat it. Especially Lisbon, because this is supposedly where these were invented. They are egg custard tarts in a crispy puff pastry. The fame of these little sweet treats has spread far and wide around the world. But how did the original egg tart come to be? We can actually do a full episode on that very, very soon. And where are the best egg tarts in Lisbon? Well, you're going to have to check out our article, foodfuntravel.com slash Lisbon podcast to find that out. But yes, they are famed to be originally from Lisbon. And we're going to find out if they are or not in that full episode. Faturas. That is a big, fat Portuguese version of churros. Mm -hmm. Yes, the Spanish churros. Yum, 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 yum. Is it Spanish? Ooh, there is contention over which country actually invented it. A topic which we are going to cover also in a future episode because it's a heated debate. Caldo Verde, which is a soup. It's very common in Lisbon to get a soup of the day, and quite often caldo verde is going to be what you get offered. It's a warm green soup made with simple ingredients like potatoes, kale, olive oil, salt, and chorizo. It was voted one of Portugal's seven gastronomic wonders by locals in 2011. They had this big quiz, and they got everyone to like vote on what was their favorite Portuguese dish, and this was in the top seven. Well, so. All right, chorizo, which is, of course, the cured sausage version of chorizo, which you would know from uh, Spanish cuisine, but this comes a lot softer than your traditional chorizo. And uh, the tradition in Portugal is to take the whole thing and bring it to the table on a ceramic dish, and then they light it on fire. And they, uh, until the skin is all nice and crispy, they put a couple of cuts in the sausage and it all crisps up. And it's actually, that is a very nice way to eat this dish. Mm, and it, it's spectacular fun on the table with a load of flames. But definitely chorizo in Portugal. I don't think we would be allowed to get away with saying that it's the Portuguese version of Spanish chorizo. It absolutely isn't. No, it's, they're it's, both sausages. It's quite different. It is their version. It is not Spanish. It is Portuguese. Very much so. Next up, feijoada, which is a hearty bean stew containing various pork bits, including the chorizo and blood sausage as well. And yeah, you know, nice chunky pieces of pork. It's a hearty, hearty Portuguese dish. Pork and beans is something that's popular all through Latin America, but the feijoada specifically is the Portuguese version that was invented in Portugal, but it's become popular in all of the colonies of Portugal, like Brazil as well. Cocido, a stew considered by many as the national dish. A uh, national dish, because bacalao is also a national dish. So yeah, one of the national dishes. It, it actually would be cocido a portuguesa, which is a thick stew of vegetables with various kinds of meat. The favorite meat is pork, of course. Obviously. They love their pork. Uh, cook and served in a variety of ways. So everything is thrown in one pot, boiled all up. The stock is served as a soup and then the meat and veg is served on a plate separately. This is a really popular dish from Portugal and Spain. 
Who invented it? <laughs> oh, oh, it keeps coming one. up. Uh, we do plan to look at that more in our What to Eat in Madrid podcast, which is coming soon. Piri Piri Chicken. Which oh, yeah. Is, yeah, which is awesome. Uh, spatchcocked or butterflied, depending on what term you use to describe that. The whole chicken is grilled over hot coals. Oh, it's wonderful. The coals uh, is the key. The coals is definitely the key. You want it properly barbecued. You can't do it on a grill in the oven. It's much nah. better over hot coals. Uh, the piri piri refers to the hot spice rub, which of course is around that whole piri piri chilies that we were talking about a couple of times through the episode already. It makes that skin all crispy and delicious. Lots of salt, of course, as well to make that happen. The roots of this dish doing piri piri chicken is probably from one of Portugal's African colonies. But we're going to actually look into the full story of Piri Piri Chicken in another episode as well. That's why we're just doing it in the lightning round today, because it's another one of those dishes that's become so worldwide famous. But yeah, in Portugal, much better than Nando's. Forget Nando's. Forget Nando's. We're talking juicy chicken that's just leaking juices all over your face. It's wonderful. You haven't tried chicken until you've tried a real Portuguese Piri Piri Chicken. Yeah. So more info on those dishes and many more dishes, I think there's about 35 in the full article, are at foodfuntravel.com slash Lisbon podcast. All righty, we're on to our final round for this episode, desserts and drinks. And let's talk about a drink first, actually. Let's talk about gingina. We hadn't heard of this until we went to Lisbon. Yeah. Because it's a Lisbon thing. It's not like a Portugal, Portugal thing. Although I think you can get it in other places, but it's not like something people just offer you all the time. No. Whereas in Lisbon, it's like, this is the Lisbon liqueur. Uh, Gingina is a liqueur made from sour cherries. And the word ginja, which is sort of the root for gingina, it it actually means sour cherry. Yeah. So it's like Morello cherries, uh, those sorts of things. And yeah, that's what they used to make this booze. Uh, this is actually- like a hooch, like old ladies will sell you out of their windows in Lisbon. Yes. Like it's that prevalent. Like you just got to know the right window and some old lady will come there and it could or could not have been made in her bathtub. You do not know, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because I mean, it's alcohol. It's yep. all been purified. Yeah, There's no bacteria fine. going on. It's all good. Uh, so we took a food tour with withlocals.com around Lisbon. Uh, we visited... One of the original, probably the original, there's a touch of contention, but this is almost certainly the original Gingina hole in the wall bar where you just stand up and drink your shot on the street. Uh, our guide, Luciana, took us there, and here's a quick clip with her. The guy that created this liqueur was from uh, Galicia, in Spain, and was the first shop in Lisbon to sell the beverage. And it's very popular since then because it's very cheap, one euro and five cents. Very delicious, very tasty. We can feel the flavor of cherry. Actually, ginger is a type of cherry and it's alcoholic, like 23% of alcohol. So a lot of locals come here when we need something to pick up. Yeah, warms your soul. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, the inventor of gingina is actually from Galicia which is a region in Spain just north of Portugal. His name was Francisco Espinera, and he founded this little gingina shop in 1840, and it's still there. That's where we went. It's super cute, too, and you will see... I mean, it's not even really that known by tourists. It's mostly locals going in there to grab their little shot on their way home from work. or Yeah. It was definitely tourists going in, but, I mean, anyone went there. It's not like there's busloads of tourists no. lining up to go into this little store. It is still very authentic. It's just dribs and drabs of people walking in, and it's tiny. And sticky. The floor it's... is so sticky. This is how you know that you're there. If you can't lift up your shoes, yeah. you're, you're nearby. You're close. <laughs> yeah. The stickier it gets, the closer you are. Yeah. I mean, it's so tiny. It's basically a counter and a door, and when the door's open, you buy Gingino, and when it's not, you yep. don't. That's it. It's like, and then you drink it on the street, which is so crazy. Yeah, this little shop was founded in 1840, and it's the first shop, supposedly, that was dedicated just to selling this drink. It's actually quite likely the drink had already been made in Portugal since at least the 17th century. It just hadn't been like a commercial product sold in an actual shop. Yeah. It's something that people would drink at home, or maybe, as we said, like, yeah, in some areas of Portugal, you can still just walk up past windows and they're like, you want, you want a shot? It's a euro for a shot, like that sort of thing. Maybe it was more like that before. We're not really 100% sure. But the actual drink itself, the ginger, it's made by macerating sour cherries in brandy. So you basically leave them there to soak so that all of the flavor starts to go into the booze and turn it all sort of colorful and red. 
as I said, the Portuguese name for the fruit is ginger. And so that's what's going in the maceration. And then at the end, once it's macerated for ages and picked up all that wonderful flavor, it's mixed with water, sugar, and cinnamon. And this gives you this sort of sweet and sour beverage that you can sip. So you get shots, but don't shot it. Just you know, have a little sip. It's very nice. Warms your belly a lot. So you can have it served with or without a couple of whole cherries in there as well, which I highly recommend having the cherries because they are soaked full of booze. <laughs> they give you a nice little kick in the face the second you chew into them. They're awesome. It gives you a nice little afternoon buzz to walk around Lisbon with. It certainly does. And you can get it in a shot glass. That's sort of the way that most people do it. But also you can request an edible chocolate cup, which we, we had no idea when we went. What? But I read their website. You tell me this now? Yep. That sounds amazing. I know. I know. You could just have it in a chocolate cup, you sip it out, and then you just eat the cup away, and it's full of boozy cherry fruit. I cannot tell you how pissed I am right now. Next time we go. (sighs) Yep. Chocolate cups. As we said, you can find this from old ladies in windows. If you walk around the Alfama district, it's a little easy to do that. Definitely. uh, Because that's like a very quiet local neighborhood uh, that's quite central, but doesn't have all the cars driving around. No, it's very pedestrian. Pedestrian Mm. pedestrian area. And... Also, you can just get it in the supermarket or restaurants. At the end of a meal, we had someone just go like, you want some of this? And we got a free shot at the end because that's what they do. Yeah. So very easy to find. All right. Now, we mentioned pastis de nada is something we're going to talk about in another episode. That's the egg tarts because there is a big story behind that. I've already done the research. The episode's coming really soon. It is surprising how big the story behind that is. It's awesome. So instead, to wrap up this episode, something with a much shorter story. And a dessert we literally fell in love with the second we bit into it for the first time. Pau de Deus. O-M-G. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Yes. What does Pau de Deus mean? What is it? It's like the bread of God. It is the bread of God. And it was sensational. It is the bread of God. It just is. It is. So it's a sweet bread. So, but it... It's brioche. It's, yeah. yeah. It's a brioche bread. But, oh, my goodness, the, the, the flavors that just filled your mouth, and it was so soft and lovely, and there was a bit of coconut going on there as well. Well, it actually has a sweet, eggy coconut mix on the top. Oh, That's so where all that flavor good. comes from. So it's got this crust, and they bake it, and the top can start to go a little bit crispy. It depends who's made it, whether it's still soft or whether it just goes a little crispy on top. And, yeah, it's a bite of heaven. And you don't even really like coconut, like anything – you won't I drink don't. pina coladas or no. anything like that. Not a big fan of coconut at all, unless it's on a lamington. And we will have to look at lamington. And no one knows what that is apart that from is Australians. That is an Australian dessert that is amazing. And I'll, we'll have to do like Australian foods one time, which will take a lot of research because there's not a lot of Australian foods. We've ripped it off from everybody. But la- oh, anyway, coconut. Yeah. So that's it. It's a coconutty topped brioche. And this coconut eggy thing that they put on the top, I, I don't know how you would even describe it. It's just this sweet paste yeah, that's so beautiful. So it just adds to the nice, simple bread roll thing to bring this strong, intense flavor of coconut and sweetness. It's so good. There's no story behind this. No, it's I just, just wanted good. to mention you should, it. It's good and you should try it. You, you should, should eat it. Definitely try it. So you can find out uh, an easy spot to find a very nice powder de Deus in Lisbon, as well as information on all the other dishes we talked about and more at foodfundrival.com slash Lisbon podcast. So that's it. That's it. That's what you should eat in Lisbon. You will not leave Lisbon lighter unless you do, unless you walk up all the hills. You could, you could, if you walk all the hills of Lisbon while eating all this food, you could balance out weight wise. There's a lot of hills. So don't take the tram, walk, and maybe you won't put on weight, but you should put on weight. If you're on vacation, you got to put on weight. Calories don't count on vacation. Exactly. Yeah, so all of this stuff is unique things that you can get in this area that, you know, while there might be, because as we said, Portugal definitely took their food around the world. And so there's variations. So like we had like egg tarts, which is like the pastel de nada in, in Hong Kong. And, and we had different things in Goa. And, you know, there's different variations. But you have to try the Lisbon version because it's, the hub of Portugal, and it's where it all began. So this is where you're getting those original flavors. Yeah, there's a lot of foods that have been created abroad, and then you can get them there. So if you want to get a Goan curry, like a from Goa in India, there's plenty of places that are doing that. If you want to get Angolan curry, you can get that. If you want to get Brazilian food, there's a lot of Brazilian restaurants. 
So there's lots of different things you can eat, but in terms of traditional Portuguese food that was really founded in Portugal, the stuff we talked about today are some of the most uh, important dishes. Pão de Deus is definitely a Portuguese bread. Mm. Uh, it's not from Lisbon. Uh, it's just something we had to mention because we loved it. It's so good. And we went back and ate it like again. We had it on, we went on tour with, with, with locals. That sounds really weird. Yeah, with, with locals. With, with locals. Yeah, as you said, with Luciana. And she took us to this place and she was like, I just, it, I don't even think, what's she saying? She's like, I don't even think this is on the tour schedule. It's, only, it's not on their regular tour. It's only on her tour. Yeah. She takes people there because she loves it. And I loved and it. And she said really she loves she seeing everybody's face when they bite into it for the first time because that's what makes the tour worthwhile, seeing everyone's face when they bite into the bread of God. Yeah. So if you do take a tour with them and you don't get to eat that, then do check out our article and make sure that you go and yeah, find it. Yeah, drop by the store and give it a try. Yeah, all the different tour guides have different specialities and different things that they do. So, yeah, just because you don't necessarily get to try that, make sure you do drop around to the store and, uh, and get some... Bread of God. Oh, yeah. So that's it. Lots of tasty things to eat. And if you want to support the show, then please do follow, subscribe, recommend us to friends, like do anything, leave us reviews. Five-star reviews are the only ones worth leaving, just to let you know. I mean, I don't know if you've thought about leaving a four or a three, but they're not very good. I like five. I like Five's fives. really good. I like five. I think five's, five's a good the number. Best one. So, yeah. yeah, do a five, I reckon. Yeah. Get a few more of those. Get us up the rankings a bit, get a few more listeners, and that means we can keep this show running, putting our time into it and doing all the research and actually going to these countries and trying these foods and letting you know about them. Yeah, definitely. And also, if if there are any dishes that you would be interested in learning more about, uh, feel free to email us at megzy at foodfuntravel.com, and we'll see if we can squeeze it into our itinerary and maybe try some of this food and find out the history, see if there's any any interesting history there that you don't necessarily know about. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if you run a food tour somewhere interesting, something like that, also, you know, contact us, let us know. We're always doing food tours with different companies and it's always a lot of fun because we like to eat. So, you know, especially anywhere in Europe, we're in Europe this year. So, you know, anywhere around Europe, you want to get us in for, to try some amazing food and show us some new things that but we might not have But it's got to have some good history to it. Yeah. It's we got to have a good story. Dishes with a story. That's what we're all about. All right. That's it for this episode. If you go into Lisbon, enjoy it. It's a really beautiful city. It's such a great city. You're going to love it if you haven't been. Uh, if you have been, you know you love it. You know that. And have if, fun. If you're just living vicariously through us and hearing about all these tasty things that are out there, just look up some recipes online and try making them home. Yeah. Do it. Do it. Do it. All right. See you next time. Thanks for listening to The Dish. Don't forget to subscribe and keep this podcast on the air by giving us a five-star review on iTunes or wherever you listen. Also, come join our foodie community on Facebook in the Food Worth Travelling For Facebook group. Catch you next time.